Okay, I hope you all enjoyed your break and you had a chance to fill out those surveys. The more information you can put on those, the better, of course. Our next presentation is a traditional knowledge and skills as part of outdoor environmental science with Christopher Dube. Chris Dube, an educator at Lake Superior High School in Terrace Bay, is passionate about creating experiential programming and authentic learning experiences for students. He was awarded the 2022 Natural Curiosity Edward Bertinsky Award for teaching excellence in environmental education. He has developed a locally focused yet globally relevant multi-credit outdoor environmental science program based on the Ontario Curriculum Documents PAD slash SVN. The OES program consists entirely of hands-on project-based learning activities employing authentic and alternative assessment methods and Indigenous ways of teaching and learning. So let's welcome Christopher Doob. Thanks. Oh, he's got it. There you go. Thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> All right. Hi, my name is Chris Dubay. Um, so let me figure this clicker out. Perfect. I just want to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, I respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek Nation, in the traditional territory, Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robertson Superior Treaty of 1850. Also, I respectfully acknowledge that the high school that I work at in Terrace Bay is located on the traditional lands of the Ojibwe people of Pace Platte First Nation, Pogwishing, and their ancestors. I would like to acknowledge the history that many nations hold in this area. And I'm committed to a relationship with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people based on the principles of mutual trust, respect, reciprocity, collaboration, and the spirit of reconciliation. I'd like to go back to this picture um, in a second, actually. Maybe I'll move forward. This presentation will explore the double credit locally developed outdoor environmental science. Uh, I teach at a high school here. In Ontario, we have to follow the curriculum. How do we make things happen? So as previously, previously mentioned in another uh, presentation, what curriculum documents do I use? It's PAD 3.0 and SVN 3M, which is an environmental science uh, at Lake Superior High School. Um, I'm a project-based, totally hands-on, authentic learning. Uh, we learn by doing. That's my philosophy of education. And I bring that into this specific course. So it integrates knowledge and skills from peers, local surroundings, and diverse community members. So our aim is to learn about truth and reconciliation, residential schools, 94 calls to action, cultural teachings, and outdoor skills from elders, knowledge keepers, from Page Platte on their traditional lands. This presentation will describe the course and the big ideas of the course, such as global citizenry, sustainability, and activism. Presentation will describe how Indigenous ways of learning and knowing have been integrated successfully as part of the curriculum. Um, land-based learning, again, a lot of people have said, oh, we've been doing land-based learning since before land-based learning. Traditional knowledge and skills integrated within the curriculum. Is it a land-based learning course? No, it's an environmental science course. Double credit, kids are with me from September to the End of January, all afternoon, 1230 to three o'clock. So what are the big ideas? Sustainability and environmental awareness, local activism, and how local activism can um, translate to global citizenry and how we grow as people by being active within our community. So there's a few, as an academic and as an outdoors person, there's a few um, journal articles that I've drawn upon in the past. Some are a little bit old, 2012, but it's, it doesn't get old. Uh, two Eyes Seeing into Environmental Education. Uh, it's in the Canadian Journal of Environmental Education. It's all online if you want to access any of these. Uh, Indigenous Environmental Education for Cultural Survival. Uh, land as Teacher, Understanding Indigenous Land-Based Education, and that's a UNESCO document. Um, Aboriginal plant use in Canada's boreal forest. Medicines to help us by Christy Belcourt. Holistic adventures by Raphael Moses. 
and he's out of pick river or big the gong and the last one was gifted to me and i absolutely love it it's called plants so how much uh pardon me plants have so much to give all we have to do is ask uh, it's a fantastic book if you haven't uh accessed that those are some of the resources that i've drawn upon myself just to further my own understanding what are traditional knowledge and skills and how does it relate to environmental education so the course I started it originally, beg, borrow, and steal. So Terrace Bay, our school's 100 kids. Um, we have declining enrollment. Our main source of employment is the mill. Uh, mill goes down. I get a job. Okay. Now, students, they're stuck in this rut. Nobody's going outside. Lots of unemployment. All that kind of stuff. I like being outside. Bring the kids out lots just for fun. Let's go outside, let's go for a hike. We live in Terrace Bay. We're right on the water. Okay, so over time, declining enrollment. How are we going to create a class to get the kids out? So at the principal time, beg, borrowed, and steal, I basically said, give me two classes, combine two classes in the one, give them to me both, but give me one section on the timetable and let's call it outdoor environmental science because in my opinion science should be outside every single book that you read as a textbook everything all that uh, data has been collected in the field <laughs> reading an ecology textbook blows my mind we should be out there hands-on doing this so that's how it started and then once you have your foot in the door i was like wow one period's not enough i need two so I was lucky enough that I was given a second period. So again, it runs all afternoon. You can't go anywhere in 76 minutes. If you really want to go somewhere or do something and collect data or be in the field or do a project in the community, you need more than 76 minutes. So one of the first projects I started with zero budget. A lot of you have, I'm going to echo what a lot I'm hearing before is that how are we doing this? We should be compensating our elders. How are we? getting on the land? How are we buying canoes? How are we doing any of the things that we need to do? It's money, right? How do we access funds, especially in a public system that's strapped for cash big time, right? So take a look at this. Uh, this is a picture of me. Got my truck in the background. I whipped up. I went to the dump. I picked up some uh, two by fours, that uh, pipe I was given, and I harvested a bear. And uh, myself and a member of Pays Platt First Nation, uh, we started to scrape bear hides as part of this program. Uh, I was lucky enough to be part of a, a, a class in Thunder Bay that uh, we did moose hides and deer hides, and I wanted to try my hand at a bear hide, and um, that was one of our first projects. So the land is a teacher. Going back to the UNESCO document, a lot of the sort of philosophies or things that are outlined uh, in that document and how I've tried to incorporate it within my environmental science program. It's uh, science, implications for science, culture, politics, language, environmental stewardship, and land rights and reconciliation. So here's a picture of my class. Uh, a good buddy of mine used to teach at Lakehead. He picked up a 36 foot Montreal Voyager canoe. Uh, this past September, and I'm probably getting a bit ahead of myself, um, but we went from Pays Platte. We camped there for three nights, and I'll get more into that in a bit. And uh, we left in the Voyager canoe with a knowledge keeper who wanted to bring us to uh, an area, and he was collecting eagle feathers for his regalia, and he wanted to teach students about it. And that's a picture of us. But going into that, there's a lot, there's a lot of work that goes into creating these sorts of opportunities and this sort of collaboration and these kind of moments of learning uh, between elders and knowledge keepers and the youth. It brings together layered concepts like the importance of language and the geography of stories, cosmologies and worldviews land protection and rights, rationality and accountability, a connection to reconciliation and more, intergenerational knowledge transfer. And this is the last two days sitting 
<laughs> in the back and absorbing what everybody has been saying and how the stories that I'm being told, the intergenerational knowledge transfer, it's critical. How, what are we learning? How are we learning to live and be people and stand 10 feet tall? Uh, these are opportunities for these students to be working with our elders or knowledge keepers. Here's um, my class. This is a picture again from this year when we were camping at the powwow grounds, Pace Platt. And um, John was leading them in woodland art. And a lot of kids, if they don't take art, they never do it again. But what are the stories behind this? What knowledge is being transferred to Indigenous and non-Indigenous students? At Lake Superior High School, Pace Platt is a very small community, maybe 300 people. And it's we have about 20% First Nation students at our school. And coming to Thunder Bay, and I think it's important for both for knowledge transfer from elders and knowledge keepers to the, their youth. But I also think it's extremely important for non-Indigenous kids to hear these stories. How, does, how do we move forward with truth and reconciliation? How do we move forward? What's a 94 calls to action? Well, how do we actualize, how do, what's the action part of 94 calls to action? A friend of mine once said, truth then reconciliation. And I thought that was a lot more fitting. And how, how does that look in the high school? One of the things I've struggled with is the lack of authenticity with a lot of initiatives. Orange shirt, it's, it's great. I'm glad we do it. However, it's not as deep as I want it to be. As somebody who is an authentic learner and wants to have hands-on and experiences, students learn through experiences. They don't learn through watching a video in history class for 15 minutes while they wear an orange shirt. Um, I'm glad they do it. I'm not putting that down at all, but it lacks that authentic, that authenticity that we need. The land as a teacher focuses on understanding how knowledge connects to and comes from the land, including water, sky, and everything connected to them. And you can imagine from like an environmental education standpoint, this is the piece that connects a lot of Western science is like, here's our climate change models. It's like, well, let's go to these places. Let's, if you're connected to the land and you're from that land, then you want to help and preserve that land and make that, that land better. These are the teachings that our students need to hear, not, hey, here, do it. Let's watch this climate video. It's very contrived. It's not authentic. It, it, it won't lead to lasting changes. We need to change the how we feel inside. And we need to have the students connect with, again, our knowledge keepers and our elders in order for this like transformation to happen. So here are some big ideas from 2 I seeing. So the recent visions of environmental education now include a fundamental acknowledgement, the well-being of humans and the environment are inseparable. Wow, of course. Um, I'm glad it's there, but it, again, it's uh, focuses on interconnectedness, transformation. Yesterday, we touched on holism for sure, talking about mind, body, spirit, caring and responsibility. And so here's a student of mine. Um, with a diamond willow walking stick that he painted for our three-day hike on the Caskill Trail, which we can access right from our high school. It's rooted in experiences of nature, community, and land, and communicated through storytelling. And this has been the domain and the foundation of Indigenous education for millennia. Again, it's teaching non-Indigenous students about storytelling. And I'm going to get into that a little bit um, when I talk about uh, Farley Mowat and Never Cry Wolf, a book that we uh, talk about. I'm gonna get into that real quick. So, an indigenous perspectives will challenge, enrich, strengthen, and unite the following leading ideas in environmental education. So story. Um, I was, I'm super fortunate. Uh, Pogwashin invited me out for a couple sunrise ceremonies in the fall. I did one with my class and I came back for another one in late October. 
and um, the meaning of stories and, and bringing that back about the land and about culture and about how we are as people and what makes a good person, what it means to live in a good way. Interconnectedness is connected to systems. Wholeness and holistic approaches, we mentioned that earlier, as seen with ecological illiteracy, pardon me, loving relationships and spiritual connections. Land nature experiences is connected to nature deficiency disorder and biophilia. And land and community education, which is place and community-based learning. So taking care as connected to community action projects and change making is related to radical nature of environmental education. So again, a lot of this for me as part academic, it's how do I justify a lot of the things that I do to the higher ups, right? They'll be like, wow, how are you hitting the curriculum documents? How are you assessing anything? What is actually even going on? So having students on the land, whether they're doing projects or science or cultural teachings at Pace Platt, um, it's these are sort of the philosophies that, that drive um, what I'm trying to, that drive what I do every day. There we go. Some Indigenous environmental education for cultural survival. So founding Indigenous environmental education programs within ind Indigenous knowledge systems is one of the most important ways of strengthening our cultures, promoting environmental protection, and realizing uh, the realization of sustainable local economies and supporting students through healing and decolonization processes. So the following elements are necessary for programs attempting to promote Indigenous knowledge as the foundation of Indigenous environmental education including elders as experts. And when I first moved to Terrace Bay, uh, I started coaching soccer. And uh, there's a kid from Pace Platt. He wanted to play. I was like, okay, sweet, man. Like, uh, I'll get you some cleats, whatever. He had work boots, steel toe work boots. I'm like, I'll get some cleats, play. So submitted my roster to the gym teacher at the time. And she's like, oh, this guy can't play. I'm like, why? Well, um, there's no late bus to Pays Platt. What? There's no late bus to Pays Platt, right? So that pretty much sums up our relationship with the Pays Platt First Nations when I first moved to this school. Including elders as experts. Language, connection to the land, and then how blending Western science with indigenous knowledge. So changing, challenging popular scientific assumptions. And this is where I want to get into Never Cry Wolf. Never Cry Wolf is a book written by Farley Mowat in the 1950s. I really wanted to do a literacy component in my outdoor ed. I find a lot of kids, they've never read a book. The, the sort of philosophy is like, fake it till you make it. Um, we sit in a circle and we read Never Cry Wolf. And just briefly, it starts off by Farley as a little kid, loving science, going through this university system of the 50s, the rigid scientific knowledge, data collection, and he gets this portfolio. Okay, we're flying you up into the middle of the tundra, dropping you off, and you have to tell us why wolves are, all the caribou are dying, and all the hunters are saying it's the wolves' fault. All right. So go collect data and come back and tell us why the wolves are eating all the caribou, right? And the whole time he's trying to use West, the Western scientific methods and the collection that was prevalent within the 50s to prove something that, that wasn't real. It's not the wolves, right? Never cry wolf. Um, it's over hunting, unsustainable, right? The hunting people hunting out of planes, flying up from the States or whatever, hunting out of planes. And it talks about that. And, and it talks, there is a character who's Inuit, Otanak, and he's like, he's dropping truth. Here's what it is. Oh yeah, but that's not in a book. Well, here's another truth. Oh yeah, well, that's not science. Here's another truth. Well, well, and it really opens up the conversation to have about 
how how knowledge is revered within science systems, like the scientific community, how how that kind of knowledge is revered. And listening the last couple of days, I it, that really hit home as well that we've been talking about this for two straight days. So looking to our ancestors to prepare for the future, protecting land and building communities, supporting decolonization, so solving problems using both knowledge systems. So here's my class at the Powell Grounds with Krabby, Claudette Morriso, who's the elder that I have formed a, a relationship with that's extremely special to both her and I. Um, we've been able to really work together to make good things happen at our school. So there's my outdoor class sitting around the fire. Matthew Goodchild's in the blue shirt. Um, Nicole Dupuis in there, and we're singing the Mukwa song. Making space for resistance. So what community projects are we doing? Uh, had a conversation earlier. Uh, what's the difference between community activism and uh, global citizenry? I'm not gonna, <laughs> I got someone, I could talk. Uh, grounding programs and in indigenous philosophies of education. I've talked about, about this. Here are some, I've, the rest of my slides are pictures. So here's a few projects that we've done. So we, I start out with first aid every year. Then we do a swim test. Um, how do I do a swim test? Don't you need lifeguards? Well, guess what? If you're running this program, I, beca I, I went back. I was a lifeguard when I was 18. I went back. I became a lifeguard again. I became a canoe instructor. I became wilderness first aid instructor, wilderness first aid certified. Um, I'm a paddle Canada this, paddle Canada that, whatever. Whatever you need me to be to satisfy those OFIA requirements, I will do it. I did it. Jump through all your hoops. So here's two students learning um, how to do CPR. In the middle, I have two students. I became Green Check certified for GPS GIS uh, instructor, so I can teach this as part of our environmental schism. I applied for environmental schism when the schisms first came out, and I got that. Uh, so that's part of my funding sources, the environmental schism through the ministry. They're doing mapping. Uh, learning how to use compasses. It's not a dead skill. People are like, oh, GPS is around, phones are around. GPSs have batteries and fallen lakes. I keep, I try to tell the kids, like, I keep um, a compass on you all the time. Uh, I make them what I call hillbilly first aid kits. I get a Ziploc freezer bag. I get a roll of electrical tape. I get some band-aids. I get some gauze. They put it in there. They put it in their jacket and they come to class with that all the time. And then a lot of kids, funny enough, Somebody hurt themselves on a boat that summer. Guess what? They had their hillbilly first aid kit on them in their jacket. Okay, the next one is plant presses. So I've sort of come together with um, some Western science and indigenous knowledge, speaking with Krabby, learning how to offer tobacco and give thanks. So previously, we used to do plant presses as part of our plant identification unit, and now we've through talking with Krabby, we've incorporated that aspect as part of it. So they also learn how to use GPS, GIS, where's that plant from? How is it identified? How do you know what it is? But also giving thanks. And what do we do after? We hang them up. And then at the end of the school year, I get together with them and we bring the plants back outside and we offer tobacco and we say thanks once again. First aid. Here's my class at the bottom during the pandemic. The library needed picnic tables put together, so we're out there doing that. Uh, I hike the Caskill Trail with my students. Uh, we do multi-day hikes. That's part of it. So we learn how to set up tents. We learn how to cook. We learn how to do food planning preparation. Uh, uh, leave no trace camping, all that kind of stuff. And then we spend time on the Caskill Trail. My class, a couple years ago, I got a grant for about $15,000 through OTF. Um, we are able to get bear boxes, poo boxes, fire rings, and do sustainable campsite development. We developed 11 campsites along the Cascade Trail. It's a free trail that runs between Rossport and Terrace Bay. So the classes became stewards of this 53-kilometer trail. And every year subsequently uh, that we go on it, we help maintain it with a group of volunteers. Um, we recently started a drumming project. Krabby has become this year elder in residence, which is amazing. Um, she comes in with a group of others here, and they come in twice a month for drumming during lunch.
okay, so this picture on the left, uh, a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, I, I was hanging out with my buddy, Gary Bouchard from Paige Platt. And I was like, you know what, man, I'm so tired of you guys coming to us. It sucks. I said, we need to do something. We need to go there. We need to see you. How do we do this? And I don't know, we're sitting around and we're sitting on the powwow bleachers. I'm like, you know what, man? Let's, let, and again, the previous woman, I uh, can't recall your name. She's like a huge heart dream big. So I'm like, how about we just write this massive grant, how about revitalization project? And let's just start and let's apply for some new uh, bleachers. I'll write this grant. And everybody's like, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> Who knows it will happen, but whatever, dream of believe it, achieve it, right? And uh, so I applied for it and the pandemic hit. And then I found out I got it. I got $30,000. So what I did is I took my class after the pandemic and I said to Krabby, I'm like, we're coming to visit. We're bringing new bleachers. Let's go to the Midday Lodge. Let's make it cultural teachings. Let's learn about the significance of powwows. Let's do it. Let's go. So I got three, 30 grand and um, I'll show you here in a second. That was the original. If you go back, if you remember back to that original uh, slide, uh, there's a bunch of kids all over. I think there's another one here. Um, that's my canoe. I just want to show you this one. No, where is he? Um, I don't even know how much time I have left. I'm so sorry. Do I have half an hour? Oh, that's beautiful. Okay. <laughs> I really want to show you this because I'm on this topic. Please, Brody, where are you, buddy? No. Oh, I've ruined it. There's Brody. I don't even know if I have it. And I, I can't believe I lost it. Okay. There's Brody right there. Okay. So I'll tell you a little bit about <laughs> Brody. Um, grade nine, First Nation, foster care with a white family, super angry. Um, you know, hood up all the time, whatever. There he is in the red. And I don't know where it happened to my picture, but I, he's in my outdoor class. And I'm like, hey, man, we're going to go to Pace Pot. Have you ever been? No. Okay. I talked to Claudette. I'm like, I got a kid you need to meet. He needs you. And we were there. And uh, he's like, hey, Mr. B.A., when are we doing the bleachers? When are we doing them? Hey, we gonna, what, what, you know? And, and the, you guys talk about change between a classroom and, and being on the land and being with his people. It's like night and day, the kids. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I just throw some pictures up here, but there's a picture of it. It started raining and he's by himself making it happen. I couldn't be prouder. Like, and I got more pictures of him because that was two years ago. You should see what he's doing now. Uh, there's a picture of, of us uptown. Uh, they, for some reason, they took all the sand out of all the, all the uh, play swing sets at, our, at our, our school, at the elementary school. And then there's this huge pile of wood chips. So I was like, well, I'm going to go back up to my truck to this pile of wood chips. You guys are loading them all in my truck. And then we're going uptown Terrace Bay and we're going to redo all the beds because they look horrible. So that's what we did for two days. Um, the township of Terrace Bay, if you haven't been down at the main beach, it's absolutely gorgeous. We've got a brand new pavilion. Um, all the uh, picnic tables were rotted out, dry rot. Nobody had taken care of anything. So I said, you know what, you want to learn some math? You want to be hands-on? Let's go. So I hustled the township for some money. I said, you guys want this? We'll do it. Free labor. You just got to pony up everything. So they're, they're trim cladding. We took it apart, the old ones, with a grinder because all the screws are all solid. And then they're sitting there trim cladding them. And then they're putting them together, making sure everything's square. Hands-on learning. Uh, I was lucky enough to take my master naturalist. It's like a five day or seven day course at Lakehead University a few years ago. One thing I was able to do is connect with a lot of the professors at Lakehead that run the environmental science uh, department. And I was able to borrow some water testing equipment. So what are the, what's going into every Creek? What are the different sort of like water quality measurements of every Creek? 
right? So that here, again, when we're at Pays Platt and I sort of bounce all over, I'm sorry, we, we, the water song and learning Krabby talking about the importance of water and her teachings about water. And then we come back and I take this equipment. I ended up writing a grant. I'm not going to tell you who I'm getting my money from. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, who did you get your money from? Um, I ended up writing a grant because I hustle on the internet all the time. And um, I got one and this it's $3,000 and I got all this literally graduate student level water testing equipment. So we go around to each Creek and we test the water. And so we can learn about health of water. We learn about speckled trout and what kind of bugs, bugs as indicators for the health of ecosystems. So those are sorts of things that we do in the class as well. Here's Gilbert Martin. He came uh, one time he came to our class. This isn't at Pace Plot. This is us. So he, uh, I was talking with him, and he's like, "I'll teach. I'll do some traditional medicines um, and their uses." And I'm like, "Well, you're not doing it in the class, man. We're going for a hike in the bush, and we can learn about it there." And that's what we did. I have some books. These are older pictures. This I'm in year nine now of going from no program at all with zero support and a zero dollar budget. Me going to the dump to get pallets to make composters. Um, and you know, bear hide scrapers. Uh, our first camping trip, I literally put something on the terrace bay, buy and sell, said, Hey, this is what I want to do. Does anybody want to lend me some sleeping bags, tents, whatever you got? And then one of the activities I have is everybody has to set up their tents and, and uh, sleeping bags to make sure there's this one kid unrolls it and somebody had put like a bottle in there and it's like, Dube. I was like, yeah, I was like, okay, that's got to go in the garbage. Uh, you know, or like somebody doesn't have uh, poles, right? But now again, through years of hustling, uh, we have a complete set of tents. We have a complete set of camping stuff. I got those reusable plates that fold like origami um all of that now but that's years i have eight canoes now eight canoes I've, and i got some pretty good ones um i wanted to get a canoe trailer 15 grand so a buddy of mine is a welder he welded me up one for uh 1500 and i just bought it myself so i don't have to register it through the school right how, what are some things you do and how do you get around the system that confines your ability to make things happen those are a picture of the couple of the books that I, uh, I, I use. Uh, we did a canoe paddle making project one year. Well, some were great. Some look like it could be shoveling pizza out of an oven. However, um, I, I thought it was really, really good. It went really, really well. Uh, embedded within the canoes are Diamond Willow. And Diamond Willow is something a project that I did right from the get-go because uh, we have lots of Diamond Willow where we are uh, near our school. And when I was talking with Krabby, um, I told her about this diamond willow project and then she taught me again, giving tobacco, not taking from the same location. Exactly. We've been talking about with the willows. So I've incorporated this as part of my practice. And this year before we went to camp on the powwow grounds, we, uh, we brought our sticks and we did it with her as well. And then the previous, one of the previous um, presentations today spoke of, um, compensation for elders, not always just given tobacco. And that was something I had no idea about until recently. Claudette told me that, or Krabby told me that. She's like, you know, you can give something else. So Gilbert, um, our students had given him a, a hiking stick. Like one of those, one of the ones the students like give this, please give this as a, um, as a gift to an elder. So when we went for feathers, um, on that Island, and by the way, I don't know how often you come into an eagle feather. We found 40 eagle feathers. But that changes people's lives. When you, some kid is like, Dubai, I've never even seen an eagle feather. We found 40. And I'm just like, how special is this? I always say to Claude, I'm like, those three days change. It's like you live a lifetime in three days because it's so intense and it's so 
culturally relevant and it's so new to them. There's this whole like Western mentality. I had this one kid say to me one time when I was on the Cascade trail, oh, dude, we're going to make this session our bitch. And I'm like, we went through it. It poured rain and the kid was crying in the tent. And I'm like, like, who's the bitch now? But you know what I mean? But that, that shows a lack of respect for the land. It shows a lack, a total lack of respect. And, and there's that cultural mentality that we need to, I'm going to conquer this. Or I'm going to do this. No, it's, I, I don't know. We need to unlearn what we have learned. All right. So Claudette Krabby, again, she mentors me. And I, as a teacher, I feel like a lot of teachers be like, I know everything. Right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm literally, my job is to know everything a student asks me. Where's the opportunity for me to be humble? Where's the opportunity for me to be vulnerable? Where's the opportunity for me to say, I don't, I don't actually know any of this. I don't know how this needs to happen. Who can guide me so I can guide them? So Claudette, it's been good enough. Krabby's been good enough to help me. So anyway, going back to Gilbert. So we go to this island, we get 40 feathers. And then he comes on the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. And they do uh, a powwow type activity. Uh, it's not a real powwow, but, and it's sort of ask any question you want. Um, if you have questions about anything about indigenous peoples or that, and they all sat up there and they took questions from the students. It was a great, it was, it was actually, it was awesome. I loved it. And, um, but the one thing that melted <laughs> that got me was Gilbert was out there with his feathers, with his regalia, and he had his stick to offset. He's like, this stick is a perfect way to offset when I dance. And he was there dancing and the kids came up to me like, Dubé, you know what? Gilbert's got her stick. And I'm like, he sure does. Um, I went to the used uh, clothing store. And again, it's sort of like environmental sewership clothing. Uh, and just learning lost arts. A lot of time I say lost arts, lost arts. Um, so I got my trappers license years ago. And part of it is like nobody traps except for old people now. So it's a lost art. It's a lot. I learned how to sew. Um, it's lost arts. I see when we did our sewing exercise yesterday, I was amazed. I'm like, I, I love being around so many sores. Yeah, sure. It's a lot of people were poking themselves, but it was, it was so warming to me because I love, I, I love to sew. I got to fix my own gear. How do we learn how to sew? So I took a bunch of old sweaters and we cut them up and we made mittens. Again, these are the, these were the dry days, but it's still an amazing skill. So you can do stuff with no money. You can, it just takes an enormous amount of time and creativity. Um, talking about hustling. I got the NAS, National, National Archery in the Schools program. Uh, we were able to get funding. So I run that with the kids. So I became a NASP. Um, instructor as well. And we did some fundraising here. I got some kids back in the day. We did a lasagna fundraiser. Um, we hooked up with Equal Superior here in Thunder Bay. Uh, keep it, what does it say? Uh, yeah, keep it superior drains the lake, right? So we did a whole bunch of water like, and from there I ended up getting a $15,000 grant to do three rain gardens, one at the high school, one at the elementary school, and one in the elementary school in Scriber. So that was my project for grade nine to 10 science. I was teaching the next semester. Here's us, excuse me, with the pallets, uh, making composters, zero dollars. Scraping, uh, snowshoes. We have a small ski hill in town. We snowshoe the ski hill uh, at the beginning of the year uh, to help them form the base. Uh, underneath there, there's me with the transit. I'm, we have a during the pandemic, everything got shut down. Everybody knows that. So what did we do? We built a community skating rink. Um, there was an old one in the town yard, and I got a hold of those guys. I'm like, we're hauling it out. We're painting it. And so we set it up, and we take it down every year. And then I teach them the math of uh, where the most level spot in the park is. Right. And those kids aren't going to mess with it. Why? Because they're the ones who build it and maintain it. We're creating that community. Fish skin tanning. Uh, we did the tea tanning of fish high, uh, fish skin. It was awesome. We did that online virtually. That was about three months ago. All right. And there's Brody. And there he is again. So again, um, I always talk to him about like learning his culture. And I was like, I'll teach you what I can, man. And uh, but you need to go. Uh, but one thing I like to do is fish. And he's like, I've never cleaned a fish before Dubai. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll bring a bunch of fish in. 
and I'm going to teach you how to do it. And then you're going to teach everybody else. And this guy cleaned like 30 perch. It was awesome. You can see the class looking at him as a leader, developing those leadership skills, 10 feet tall. The drumming program, again, there's Jesse with the big drum, learning about all the things that we had talked about previously, feasting, um, birthing, drums, and learning the songs. So it's I'm wearing the shirt, the Anishinaabe Moen Bodaway Committee, or the ABC Anishinaabe Moen Bodaway. Um, there's Brody there with the biggest smile on his face, and there's Krabby just singing as loud as she can, the Makwa song. I love the Makwa song so much. And I learned you can only sing it at certain times of the year because you don't want to call the bear out of hibernation. So, and that stuff amazes, like, I, I love it. Okay, so I learned this. When we were doing the fish high tanning, um, another buddy of mine, he's big into plants. Um, he's a uh, First Nation from a Manitoulin Island, and he was calling um, Jin, or not Jin Singh, um, the one uh, rabbit root, um, it, it washes the sturgeon net in it. And I, and she was like, I don't remember why this plant has this name with a fish in it. And I remember I was like, yeah, because you wash the nets because the fish like that smell. And it's the language. When we talk about language reclamation, um, he's gone on to do bird, bird names and stuff like that. So say you're going down a canoe and you see a bird, that bird, the guy is like, I knew there's going to be a swamp on the other side. Well, why? Well, because we saw that bird and that bird lives in that swamp, right? And it's, and the bird's name has a connection to the tree that lives in the swamp. So it, for me, lang it, it, the spirituality of the culture, but also the, it, it, it tells of the land it's, and that's so important when I try to teach that to students or have students understand that or, or learn that that's what I'm really these moments when we're in that fish tanning um, section or we're singing the Makwa song and we're learning like, yeah, we don't want to sing this because he's hibernating. Or we're learning the name of this bird because it tells about the forest that it lives in. Or we're learning the willow. We've been talking about willow for days. And one thing I learned from my buddy Joe was the plant tells you the medicine that it has in it. And I thought that was fascinating. He's like, look at this willow. And he bends it. He's like, what do you think that's good for? And I'm like, I don't know, like bending. And he's like, no. He's like, for people with arthritis that are stiff, he's like, that plant will give you medicine to make you more flexible. He's like, the plant tells you what it, it's medicine. It's speaking to you. You just have to hear it. And I, spending enough time on the land, and I on the guy's trap line I'm on, he says, when you're young, the land scares you because you don't know what's what. But when you're older and you're and you learn these teachings, the 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 land is there to help you. You just depending on what you're looking for, is it will speak to you, and you can and and take what you need to help you, right? And those sorts of things, it resonates with me, right? And um, yeah. Uh, blanket exercise. If your schools haven't done this, I highly recommend it. Um, we had them come in uh, and do the blanket exercise with our entire students and our entire staff. It was unbelievable. Again, truth and reconciliation, truth, then reconciliation. Okay, this is this is a sweet project. How much time? I'm sorry. 15? Oh, beauty. Okay, so remember Brody? Yeah, so... Um, Pays Platt used to have a snowshoe factory and, uh, years ago, and I've been talking, our tech teacher just recently got his status, uh, cause his grandmother was from pick Mulbert. And as you know, he wasn't eligible for status. And he just recently, uh, was able to reach back and, and fill out whatever paperwork and do that. And he really is trying to relearn his culture and one of the ideas that him and I sort of came up with was let's try to find some snowshoes that were made around Pace Plat and, and use those as like the Ojibwe style and let's have students do it as part of a cultural project. And so I applied for a grant 
And the, the title of the project that we dreamed up was the Snowshoe, a historical, cultural, ecological, multidisciplinary project. So using the snowshoe is like all encompassing. So it teaches science, it teaches history, it teaches culture, right? And it's you, but it's using that as an integrating context for learning. So it's the snowshoe, but the snowshoe is so complex. I don't know, maybe for me anyway, like I see the crafts that were on the table earlier, you know, and you see a snowshoe and you're like, oh, that's amazing. But like every single part of a snowshoe has to be done in a certain way. Just the weaving, the top or the bottom is so different. So I went in the bush with Brody. Um, Claudette, again, spoke with him and I, offering tobacco, looking at the different trees, what constitutes a good tree to make snowshoes out of. All right, we found one. And there's Brody offering his tobacco. And then we hauled it out. This is about a month ago. A little bit more maybe now. Oh. And um, yeah. Yeah, there's Brody and he's yeah hauling it out. And then so what our plan is, he's just finishing up the forms. So in other words, like to make that curvature of the snowshoe, you need to have it over a certain form. So I got $1,000. So for that, that paid for all the wood for all the forms and it paid for a steamer and we built like a steam sort of tunnel or whatnot so we can begin steaming it. And then we've done all the measurements and he's all over it. And I said, well, you know what? You're gonna have to learn how to weave, man, because it's so complex, those different areas. I've never done it. Our tech teacher's never done it that knowledge has been lost from Pays Platt. There's no community members anymore. We've reached out. I've reached out to Red Rock Indian Band, reached out to Big Dagong and Pick River. It's, and I, this needs to come back and this is a priority project of ours. So we've made the forms, we've made the steamer. The next thing is cutting that wood what, and, and learning from our mistakes and then learning how to weave. Um, that's the next part. Okay. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, you could transition to that video. It'd be awesome. Uh, this is the Pays Plat trip. I think it's going to fall off. You know what you could do? Do you want to do two other three other pieces? Yeah. 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 Uh, I will allow you to bring your camera in. Yeah, we're gonna My name is Chris Dubay. I'm a teacher at Lake Superior High School in Terrace Bay. And we're here because we received a grant from three donors, uh, Hydro One, uh, TD, and the Jane Goodall Foundation to uh, do cultural activities and build bleachers here at uh, in Black First Nation. We received a grant for $30,000 approximately for between these three donors. And uh, this is years in the making. This grant is a result of, of collaboration with uh, community members and elders from Pays Black First Nation and with Krabby and with Gary Bouchard and whatnot over, over multiple years. And my vision is with truth reconciliation, um, with 94 calls to action, and uh, with residential schools, and, and now it becoming more widely known. Um, it's really important for our school, not only just to learn about it, but like the authenticity of the way we learn about um, things like that. Um, we've planned a great three days. We have, uh, 
the students have learned about uh, cultural teachings, such as like the importance of powwows. Uh, we look, talked about medicines and whatnot, and now we are on the land with members of the community from Pays Platt to actualize this project. And and for me personally, that's huge. Uh, we have the Voyager canoe over on the river. I've brought my class set of canoes. Uh, the students have set up tents uh, around here. And so it's a culmination of sort of like camping skill, um, indigenous uh, learnings and indigenous teachings. And who better to learn about um, 94 calls actions in residential schools rather than a video, um, let's listen to uh, Pace Platt. And they're our, part of our community, they're part of our school community, they're part of our greater community. And it's so important for students to come here and to do this. You, know, you two will get one more of them right over there. So I, I asked the students um, if they knew their history, their background, um, what nationality or ethnic group they came from. And a lot of them shared, um, you know, their background of, of where they come from. And then I always told them that I've always been fascinated with learning, not only from my own personal uh, history, but also to learn others. Uh, some of them said they were from uh, Mexico, uh, Germany, uh, background, uh, Italy, Italy um, Netherlands, I think one of the students had mentioned. So, and, and I just, you know, acknowledge all that uh, I tell the students to, to learn their history, to learn where they come from, not to be embarrassed or shy from where they come from. Um, uh, I don't know. It's just like you said, it's real. Yeah, I like it because it's it's people playing the music, you know, like compared to like like getting like like making it with a computer, you know, yeah, like, like all these people, like the bass player, the drummer, and the guitarist, and like the singer and all, they all like come together and get in sync to like play a song together. It's like not only I thank you uh, people for coming here. I'm very excited for all the students and the reconciliation that we're all working together because we are working on the sacred grounds of the Apollo ground and that's medicine, right? And that's how we all heal together, how we all understand each other and how to work and learn about our culture and our differences. We understand about how the weather plays an important part as it's raining now. You know, and the very important thing I would like, this is the very first time it's coming to Pace Black where a, a school from the future, present day, helped a community. All the other residential schools took away the culture, but this school, Chris Duger Bay and the Lake Superior High School is helping bringing the culture back and supporting that. And all the students that are doing that are facilitating and mobilizing their understanding of reconciliation. That's action. That's what I call action. You know, that's what it's all about. Um, so what have you learned so far from this experience? Um, I've learned a lot. I thought something that was really cool um, when they were teaching us about like their traditional medicines. Um, they basically said that like anything can really be a medicine. Like you look around you and everything's medicine, um, which I think is really cool. Um, kind of finding like the good in everything and the healing and everything. Do you think they're learning anything? And what are they learning? What do you think they're learning? I, I think they're learning some respect. Um, you know, and wording to to work together as a team player. Well, we're getting on the river. Cool. Yeah, it's awesome. We just had a lesson from Gary Bouchard on uh, some stories of the land and the and the lake and the significance of it uh, to his people. We're killing that. 
Oh no, we're sucking. Give me pepper. Down, yep. Chris well, is going to be wondering what they Chris is going to love Came back from the Greyhound. And uh, around Sault Ste. Marie area, I realized that I'm home. The trees started to look familiar. The rockets started looking familiar. On the side of the road, I recognized this lake. And, and especially when you come over Sealand, and then you see like Roscoe Bay and all that, yeah. all in front of like uh, all the islands and stuff like that. And I was just like, wow, I'm never leaving again. It's yeah. beautiful. And there's I like over it. there, it looks like by the tents, it looks really cool because it's just like we made a small village, you know? Yeah. Okay. Check, check. I think I have three minutes left. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll take them in the next three minutes. Okay. Thanks so much, Miigwech. Thanks for all oh, back here. Awesome. Email. Yeah, Krabby last summer brought him and uh, to get his traditional name. And I don't, you would, you guys would know what uh, woodpecker. What's the Nishinaabe name for woodpecker? That's it. Papas, papas, papasic, sin, papasin. Okay, and. That was extremely important. After that, he he's in my science class right now, and he's he's killing it. Um, yeah, he's doing extremely well. Okay, again, thank you, Miigwech. I appreciate it. I'm honestly honored to have presented about this. Thank you for hosting me. Wow, that was an amazing two days of workshops. Please make noise for all the presenters we had here in these two days. Every single one really, really moved me. It was, uh, I don't know about you guys, but for me, this whole two days was very emotional for me, just uh, in a good way, you know, it's just to be a part of something like this, to be a part of, be here with all of you, all you people who care so much about our youth and about reviving our culture and that seeing the importance in that and about how, how the land is where that has to happen. It has to happen out there for so many reasons. So just to do a little uh, recap. We started off with Lamar. He, uh, he taught us some really cool games. I know he said he knows over 100. So I think uh, really follow. He, he said he has an Instagram page. So make sure you go check out his Instagram page and, and keep up with that. Because uh, there's so many games. And not only are the games cultural, using our cultural items and stuff and uh sparking that interest in our culture but all the things that uh they teach in those games like he was saying the the numeracy learning multiplication and all these other cool things you could use these games to teach our youth i thought that was really really cool um we had desta buswa and fern kakagemic and bella hadiesh and her granddaughter thelma they were up here speaking um beautiful beautiful words uh bella the elder uh, really moved me and she really made a really good point about how, how our elders, especially, you know, there can't be a flat rate. You're an elder, you get a flat rate. Some, there's levels to it, to the knowledge. And some of our elders have so much knowledge and so like they really need to be shown that and, 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 and respected in that way. Um, these gifts are great, but there's in this day and age, there's no more gift better than Julian, of course, you know? And uh, so to really honor those people and make sure they're, they're given what they deserve is so, so important. And uh, just to have that cedar tea, the little cup of cedar tea and the, the Labrador tea, we call it. I just call that bush tea. And like bush, people get convinced there's different kinds of bush tea, I guess. There's another kind of, but that's what we call bush tea uh, right when I grew up. And to have that little taste of that, so amazing. I had one lady, I was, I was touring in Quebec, and this woman told me she was diagnosed with cancer. 
15 years ago, she said. So she was told by an elder to start drinking that tea every day. She said she's been drinking this tea every day and looking at her, you would think she was 20 years younger than she was. And she said she's healthy and still, you know, and she, she said she credited it all to that, that tea and how healthy that tea is. If we could switch up our coffee and our red rose Earl Grey with this bush tea more often, that's really, really, really important. And just for me, that taste is nostalgic It's for me that because we would drink that on the land. You know, so just having that little sip and just smelling that tea, I just close my eyes and I'm at the camp, you know, and so that was really amazing. Uh, we had uh, Shannon, Rachel, Sheila and Leona speak uh, from Ogden Community School. And I'm like I said, I'm really excited to get there, especially excited to get there tomorrow because they spoke so uh, highly of the school and all the work they're doing there. I'm sure the energy in that school is really, really awesome. I'm really excited to work with all them, really proud of all the work they're doing. And uh, that needs to happen in all schools, you know. Our culture needs to be brought into the schools. I remember uh, first time I went into DFC for work and just seeing every, all the artwork on the, just feeling like this is a native school. This is a school that's uh, encouraging our culture. And what a crazy feeling that is knowing that for so long, those schools were used specifically to kill our culture. We were taken away from the land and put into schools, residential schools, and even uh, the modern day schools, like the history being taught being so, we know BS, you know, like so much being left out for so long in, in our schools and now to see that stuff being brought in is it's, it's a great time to be a part of all this and we had gloria ranger got us all moving around you might have noticed i stepped out today i got a little like i said a little too sweaty yesterday but i was taking notes and i really appreciate what she does and what she's doing amazing work <laughs> so then we had traditional knowledge and skills as part of outdoor education science with christopher dubé i apologize for messing up your name there the first time Dube, not doob. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, what a what a crazy presentation! I really really enjoyed that the work that he's doing, um, bringing elders and youth together on the land, like so vital. But not just bring elders and youth together, but to be able to set it up so we can do that on the land is huge. The intergenerational knowledge transfer he talked about is vital. It needs to be done. You know, it just has to happen. And we're making that happen. And as educators, you can help be that bridge to help make that happen every chance you get. Um, the well-beings of humans and the environment, inseparable, of course. We know that the land is unhealthy. We're not going to be healthy. You know, we need to, and for us to help keep the land healthy, we need to be healthy. So let's keep doing that. And what it means to live in a good way. That's what you learn on the land. The land teaches you how to be a good person. That's what I talked about the first day. Amazing presentation. Presentations all around. Um, we're going to do some draws now. Again, for the books. But today, we actually have Lindsay King here to help give away the books. So Lindsay King is an Ojibwe storyteller and teacher from Kanjikum First Nation. She holds an EPIC, oh, sorry, an ECE diploma, a bachelor's degree in education, and a qualification in special education. As a student, Lindsay loved books and storytelling. Her most cherished moments from school were visits from elders in the community, sitting down with her and sharing stories. So let's get Lindsay King up here so we can do this draw and she can give away the books herself. So we're going to need the ballot box up here as well. Just waiting on the ballot box. Here it comes. Oh, sorry to rush you. Hey. Did you want to pick three? Yeah. Just hand it over to me. Okay. 
Hmm. Isla? Is this Isla? Do I see I L L A? Crushell. Crushell. She's not here. Oh. Okay, one more. Had about three or four that weren't here last. Joel. Joel B. <laughs> Is Joel here? Oh, snoozing and losing. <laughs> Karen de Rosier. Karen or Kareen. Looks like Karen. Yeah, Karen. No, Karen. Oh, she's online. Oh, yes, it says online in the corner. My bad. I see that now. Okay, so we'll put that aside for her. All right, make some noise for Karen. <laughs> Oh, another online one. This is Jasmine, I believe. I think that's it. Are you better at reading? Yeah. <laughs> it's online anyway, though. So, congrats, Jeff. Oh. It says online on the, but she was here. Okay, she's over here then. Nice try. Nice try, Jasmine. <laughs> Deanna Cooper. It's just silence. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's all happy. Wait, don't, 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 don't say. Good, she's not here. <laughs> Steph Bodnerchuk. Not here either. It's crazy because there's so many here. Like, how many? Christina Strickland. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Hey, hey. I, of course, I picked the rhyming name. Bruce Moose. Hey, hey, hey. I'm having better luck. All right, let's see if I get another rhyming name. <laughs> Anna Bear. I'm getting the animals anyway. Got the moose and the bear done. Don Corston. Hey, Don. This looks like Anna Marie K. There she is. Okay, I'm just going to uh, allow Lindsay here to share uh, a couple words about, about the book. Um, Bujo, Lindsay, and Tishnikas, Bigan Shkaming, and Nunji. 
Um, again, when I don't make you under my go and be Jayan Ganyan to bewitch toy and bangia. Are we in understuck? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, so what's the next one? Give it, quite make my man go get a job be Jayan. I give him a go, but Nico come back. I will be Jayan and give him go on. Go my win, Gina. Some Nipo as a band, um, as on Kian this month. Miss Inginek, Skip Zanishan, Escox Chin and McGoin, make on Ginek. So, um, Gishin, we are what much begins coming. Win the Maui, Akuzian, Nungum, my sick day. Hi, my name is Lindsay. I'm from Bikanchkum. I'm happy to be with you all today. I wish I was here for the two days because it sounds like it was amazing. Um, but I have so many days off from work this month. It's a really busy month. So if you see anybody from my school, I'm sick. Hopefully nobody's watching online. Um, I'm in special education this year, um, but I've missed being in the classroom so much that I'm going back into the classroom this fall. I remember my first year back in the classroom. I wanted so much to bring our culture back into our classroom. So I teach kindergarten. Um, and I remember seeing these behaviors and I don't know if it's the technology that's affecting all these social delays in our students, but I remember sitting in my classroom after all my kids went home and I thought, what can I do? And I remember as a little girl hearing legends and stories. Um, <laughs> back then, you know, you'd wake up, have breakfast and you'd spend your whole day outside playing with your friends. And, you know, in the evening, all the adults around you would be like, try to get you home. You know, a lot of people looked after us back then, whether or not they were family. And uh, I remember this one story, this little legend. Somebody said to me, you better go home otherwise before the moon comes out. Otherwise, you know, the little boy in the moon is going to snatch you up and it's going to make you live on the moon with them and you'll never come home to your family. And uh, I would rush home before it was dark because I didn't want to find out if it was true or not. <laughs> um, and it's those kind of stories I started sharing in my classroom with my students to, to you know, use animals and um, to address these behaviors. And these animals became our friends. You know, we became a community. These kids grew so much. They became these amazing little people who looked out for each other. And some of these stories are in my book. And I am so proud of this book. Um, Sky is the name of my niece, who I love very much. And she was very excited when she saw herself. Um, you'll also notice that the little girl is wearing the traditional Pekanchkum dress. I wear mine every Friday. And um, my next book, I just want to mention my next book, is going to be teaching kids about medicine. So keep a lookout for that. And I want to thank Nan for inviting me today and for buying my books. I'm still surprised people are actually buying it. Wow. <laughs> So thank you, Nigat. So we've got a couple more draws to do here. We got three more gifts to give away. Wesley McKay. Sir Wesley McKay. No. Sylvia 
Wesley name. Sylvia here. This is online for Krista. Krista, is this the Krista I'm thinking it is? But it's online, so I guess, right? But she's not here? Okay. Linda. Linda K. Linda K here. All right. All right, here's our last one. Joe Duncan, is it? Or Dune? Joe D. Joe's gone already? Jeez, Joe. Esther Maud. Again, double the. So you get the mystery bag. We're all excited to see what's in here. Okay, that's it for this uh, this year's conference. Very honored to be here. Um, I was thinking there might be some time at the end for me to do a song maybe, but I don't know. I think we're out of time. But thank you guys so much. Please, once again, make a round of applause for Nan and for putting this on and for all the presenters that came out. For all of you for participating so well, it's a great, huge honor to be part of this event. Hope to see you again next year. Surveys. What's that? Um, do they do we just leave the surveys on the table or do you want them handed in? I'm not exactly sure. I'm sure it's okay if they're left on the table. We could round we could round round those up. Oh, sorry, again. It's not on a, a closing prayer. Closing prayer. Let's not forget again. Sorry, I did this last night. And it, it actually was written on the agenda, so it is my fault this time. Okay, so closing prayer. But Lucy, could you please come up for our closing prayer? Okay, it's the end of the day and everybody's ready to go and I'm ready to go too <laughs> but I do have I want to say thank you I have Nan 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 staff, the team, for all your work. And uh, and it was very, very educational. I don't even know where to start, but it was just so good. All the facilitators or, or rep represent Kayawat. We know Gak Knamakiwat, Nakumake, Magak Pishawat. I mean, when to watch. I'm not young anymore. I have a birthday coming in August. And I don't hide my age. I don't hide my age. And I'm going to be 75 years old in August. My... <laughs> Then, Nakmox, Jim and Dogan, you guys show him to it. 
my dad always told me that when you turn gray, you should be honored. You honored uh, your life that God given you that many years to live. And, uh, and, uh, and I, feel, I do feel honored that uh, I will reach that. And I know my children are planning something and want to celebrate with me. Uh, to the Kenya segment, where we do not know what brings tomorrow because we're not in control. Uh, God, our Father, our Creator, we acknowledge you. At the end of the day, we thank you for being with us, your presence with us. And I just want to pray for each one as we, as we depart. We ask your blessing upon each one. We ask you for safety and protection. And just uh, give you thanks. And my Jesus, we want to give you a Amen. And I just want to say that take care of yourselves. I mean, it's been pretty heavy the last two days. So to have a self-care, chicken and medicine. I'm often guys quite sick. Me, 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 me. Thank you.